Welcome to Chain Reaction, the Foreign Policy Research Institute's flagship network of podcast series examining the political, security, economic, and social trends shaping Europe and Eurasia. Throughout the year, we're talking with experts about developments in Russia's war in Ukraine, the new European security order, the past, present, and future of the Baltic states, Russia's political economy, and great power competition in the region. Join us each month for Bear Market Brief, the understanding of, of Russia, which is broadly as Russia as a great power that has its own special path, that has a mission and that needs a strong state, you know, and, and a different path to that of the West. I think when you look at these other industries, what you find is that there's a lot of pain built up uh, in, in different parts of the Russian economy. Some of it's only going to be felt over a longer period of time. Baltic ways. There were other countries that when the war started, they were willing to be, you know, those uh, voices of uh, moral conscience. The continent. I think that this conflict today proves that we are able to go past grievances and that we are able to look into the future, into the common future together. Report in short. This is the real Achilles heel of Putin's mobilization. And of course, our flagship chain reaction. These two countries are interacting militarily or have been interacting in several different conflicts. And in some cases, they're on the same side and in some cases, they're not. New episodes are available each week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This week on The Continent. Wait a second. Defense isn't a country in Europe. Yes, but I think there's been a bit of a problem in some of the coverage of events in Ukraine, Europe, and more broadly, including on this podcast. We talk about very important, very interesting issues, but we don't always take a second and stop to explain some of the terminology and core concepts. Have you heard someone talk about fire superiority? Honestly, do you know what that means exactly? I sometimes hear terms like that, and I don't. Welcome to the Continents Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Schwartzbaum, and on this very special episode, I'm going to be asking every question you were too embarrassed to ask about defense and security issues. This will hopefully make what's happening in Ukraine a lot clearer. We're going to go term by term, jargon by jargon. No acronym is safe. Joining us today are Bob Hamilton and Rick Landgraf. Bob Hamilton is the head of research at FPRI's Eurasia program and an associate professor of Eurasian studies at the U.S. Army War College. In a 30-year career in the U.S. Army, spent primarily as a Eurasian foreign area officer, he served overseas in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Germany, Belarus, Qatar, Afghanistan, the Republic of Georgia, Pakistan, and Kuwait. He is the author of numerous articles and monographs on conflict and security issues, focusing principally on the former Soviet Union and the Balkans. He is a graduate of the German Armed Forces Staff College and the U.S. Army War College and holds a bachelor degree from the United States Military Academy, a master's degree in contemporary Russian studies, and a Ph.D. in political science, both from the University of Virginia. Lieutenant Colonel Walter Rick Landgraf is an active duty United States Army officer and senior fellow at FPRI's Eurasia program. Previously, he worked as a strategic and international engagements chief at the Pentagon. In 2019 and 20, Rick was an Army Research Fellow at the RANDS Corporation, supporting studies sponsored by the U.S. European Command. Lieutenant Colonel Landgraf has served in overseas assignments in the United Kingdom, Georgia, and NATO's military headquarters. Additionally, he has served three combat tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. He holds a BA in Political Science from McDaniel College, a Master of Public and International Affairs from Virginia Tech, and a Master of Science in Strategic Intelligence from the National Intelligence University, concentrating in Russia and Eurasia Regional Studies. Rick is presently a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech. His dissertation focuses on Ukraine and Georgia's potential NATO membership. Good credentials for this episode, I think. I want to add the important disclaimer that the views expressed here are our guests' own and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. We clear? Fantastic. Let's dive in. Bob and Rick, welcome to the continent. Great to have you with us. Aaron, thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Question one. One of the things that I've heard several times in some of the great coverage of what's happening in Ukraine these days is this idea that Russian military doctrine favors decisive fires. Hear that one a fair bit. What is doctrine? What are fires? And what could make them decisive? 
And how is that different from the way Western militaries think about war? We'll kick it to Bob for this one. I guess the simplest way to explain doctrine is it's really just a set of principles that militaries use to guide plans and operations, right? And in terms of fires, when we say fires, often you'll hear people say direct and indirect. Direct is uh, a rifle, a tank, an armored personnel carrier, or something that can see what it's shooting at. Indirect is artillery, rockets. Uh, so in this case, fires, the, this Russian decisive fires idea is talking about indirect fires, mostly artillery, rockets, ballistic missiles. And I guess the simplest way to explain the difference between the West and Russia is in, in Western militaries, we use fires to support maneuver. And in some ways, Russia uses maneuver to support fires, which they believe can be decisive on their own. So in a Western military, we use artillery, rockets, mortars, indirect fires to attrit or degrade an enemy or make him move to a less favorable position, which where we can either kill him or maneuver around him with our maneuver forces, with tanks, armor personnel, carriers, things like that. Russian doctrine envisions indirect fire being more decisive in affecting the outcome of an engagement or the war itself. And, and Russia has more artillery uh, really at every echelon, at every level in a comparable U.S. unit. Uh, what they don't have, and we found this out in Ukraine, is the logistical uh, support required for that artillery, especially in an offensive operation. Rick, anything to add on that note? <laughs> that was a, a doctrinal answer, uh, as, <laughs> as, as someone might say. Um, no, I think that was uh, Bob's spot on there. I, I think uh, Western doctrine does privilege combined arms move, maneuver and attack and, and use fires to support maneuver. Russian doctrine is, is, is sort of the, the other way around. Uh, you use a piece of terminology there, and I warned both of you in the uh, planning stage that I would, I would ask for clarification. You said combined arms. What does that mean? Yeah, so combined arms is essentially using various in a ground scenario, so ground forces, so in infantry, uh, armor and artillery, using them together to achieve a, a common obje objective or goal. So using those various types of forces together uh, in a concerted manner to uh, achieve a mission. I've heard in some coverage of the war that Ukraine's military and perhaps Russia's too have struggled with combined arms uh, using these different kinds of forces together effectively. What makes that challenging? Well, what makes it challenging is, especially from a, an offensive scenario, it, it's combined arms is, is more important offensively, in my opinion, than, than defensively. And being able to use those different tools in the toolbox of your military to, to carry out an objective. So is it, is it a logistical thing? Is it a communication thing? What, what's the, what makes that harder for militaries to learn or do, I guess is the, the right word? Yeah, I mean, log logistics is a big deal. Logistics is there's a saying in the military that that you know novices talk about operations, but experts talk about uh, logistics and are and are experts in logistics. And uh, maneuver can only go so far. And and, and w what we see in Ukraine is the kind of the incapacity of uh, the Russian mil mil military to maintain maintain its forces. And uh, I think the Ukrainian military is obviously benefiting quite a bit from, from Western support uh, to that end. And they've also shown an ability to, to learn pretty quickly. If I could jump in here, Aaron, real quick, one of the most interesting things I think we're seeing in this war is, or one of the most interesting questions it's raising is the viability of offensive maneuver, right? Whether it's even possible in, in the context of the war in Ukraine for either side to have decisive offensive maneuver and I'm going to throw out a couple of a little bit of jargon and acronyms here. But what you'll hear people say, and I think this is true, is is the combination of what we call persistent ISR, persistent in intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, the ability using satellites, using drones, using other means to basically see everything on the ground that the enemy's doing. Combination of that with precision fires, which we started out talking about, the ability to, to launch something from 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, 90 kilometers, even 300 kilometers away and put it on a, a, a spot that's, you know, maybe a meter, five meters, 10 meters wide. The combination of those two things makes it really hard for a, a, a military to have major combined arms, maneuver forces in the open attacking because they can be seen and they can be killed from long distance. So you can see everything your enemy is doing and hit them and they theoretically could do the same to you. Very interesting. But we're going to stick with Rick for a second. Another thing I've heard a lot in coverage of the war that 
Russia's military decision making and sometimes effectiveness um, can be reduced because of a lack of flexibility, because Russia doesn't really have NCOs. So I'm wondering, what is an NCO and what do they do? Why is having them beneficial? Uh, an NCO is a non-commissioned officer. And what that means is NCOs are your enlisted force. So everything from your privates all the way up to your sergeants. Major. Uh, that is different from uh, commissioned officers, which the ranks are lieutenants all the way up to four-star general. And what an NCO does, and the NCO is in charge of, of small units. Uh, they're in charge of soldiers. Um, they NCOs in, in the U.S. Army, at least, and, and many Western armies and our, our NATO allies and partners are a professional cadre of soldiers who have gone through uh, leadership training, uh, specialized training unique to their, their military specialty. And what they are in charge of is, is leading individual training uh, of troops and then, and then collectively groups of soldiers together to accomplish a mission. Uh, what, what the U.S. Army does and U.S. military does is we try to uh, power down decision making to the lowest level possible. So really kind of officers are in charge of developing a commander's intent and, and goals and missions and NCOs are in charge of implementing and how we get to those, those goals uh, and objectives. Having them as beneficial because it enables uh, officers or planners to kind of look upward and outward and look at the, a larger picture uh, and then having uh, NCOs looking kind of down and in uh, and focusing on you know, tactical tasks. So, Bob, if you could jump in, what, how does it work in Russia's military then? How do you run small units if you're not really having this set of specialists and experts in the, the tactical? So the short answer is the officers do it. Uh, and and that prevents uh, exactly what Rick said. It prevents officers from doing exactly what Rick said they do in, in Western militaries, which is looking upward, looking outward, looking long term, uh, doing the planning, right? The NCOs run the day-to-day -day training, the day-to-day -day maintenance of, of vehicles and, and, and aircraft, helicopters in the military. Uh, the officers are more uh, strategically oriented, longer term oriented. Uh, and uh, so you'll hear people say the NCO is the backbone of the Army, the backbone of the U.S. Army. And I think that's that's an apt metaphor, right, because it supports everything that the Army does. And so uh, in the Russian military, there, it is a very power up hierarchical punishment based structure in a lot of ways. Uh, and so they they don't have NCOs in the Western sense. They don't have professional enlisted soldiers with years of experience and training and education who are empowered to make decisions to conduct training, to conduct maintenance, to do all those things that NCOs do in Western militaries. All right. Thank you for that clarity. Bob, we'll stick with you for, honestly, my favorite segment of the Continent Podcast. It's the word of the day. Now, uh, for our regional episodes, that usually entails a word in the native language. We're speaking English in this episode, or with some of the jargon, are, are we really? Um, but I wanted both of our guests today to, to bring their favorite term, jargon, or acronym that is either amusing or relevant to the to the current juncture in the world. So, Bob, you said you had one that was relevant to things happening today. What is your word of the day? Yeah, so my, my acronym of the day, because we use acronyms in the U.S. military for everything, my acronym of the day is SOSRA, S-O-S-R-A. And uh, why it's relevant is because what we're seeing now uh, is Ukraine trying to breach or reduce Russian defensive lines that are extremely well prepared and in depth. And so SOSRA is how you breach an obstacle. And it essentially breaks down to suppress, obscure, secure, reduce and assault. Uh, so we can get into the details of that later on if you want to. But that's uh, that's my acronym of the day. We have a question about that. So hold the thought. Rick, over to you. What's your word, term or acronym of the day? So I have an acronym of the day. Uh, I'm an intelligence officer by trade, so I'm going to nerd out here for a second and uh, talk uh, intelligence speak. Uh, so within intelligence, there's different compartments, human intelligence, signals intelligence, um, communications intelligence. Human intelligence is the collection of intelligence using human sources. So within human intelligence, there's, the, there's two acronyms, actually, SDR. One stands for Surveillance Detection Route. Uh, and the other one stands for source directed requirement. So these are two different things. So surveillance detection route is a kind of fancy spy intelligence term 
uh, using a, a ways to identify a hostile surveillance by a, a foreign intelligence service. So we, whether you're, you're either on foot or driving a vehicle, these are ways and techniques to identify if, if you're being tracked, essentially. Source directed requirement is something totally different. Uh, it is a, a human intelligence collection requirement based on uh, what we call the placement and access of an existing source. So someone who uh, works at a certain place, has access to certain information, can collect and report on a person, event, or a place. So you could be talking about an SDR to someone who's knowledgeable in the trade, and then that person may not know if you're talking about a surveillance detection route or a source director requirement. So there could be an instance you could use the same acronym to talk about two different things in the same sentence. So it's just a kind of a <laughs> very strange acronym uh, in a kind of very compartmented area of the military. Mm -hmm. And an intel nugget from my own experience uh, in my career that uh, the Army has fairly, fairly straightforward acronyms. I'm, if I remember correctly, Navy, they, they go wild. They have acronyms within acronyms. So there's, there's a whole universe of acronyms and terms out there. Um, mm -hmm. I have an off-menu question. Could we talk about unit sizes? Because I think one of the things discussed is the Russians, they moved a brigade here and then everyone's like, oh, my God. But I don't know if everyone who's listening to that kind of talk knows how big a brigade is. So can we kind of walk up in Western sense or Russian sense, but just like ballpark size of like when we say a company or a division, like how, how many people are we talking about here? Um, real quick on, on Rick's uh, SDR, we call that acronym fratricide. And it's a whole lot more common in the military than you would think where you have two acronyms that mean completely different things to people in different parts of the military. So. Uh, but yeah, in terms of unit sizes, I mean, in the army, you know, we go squad, section, platoon, and then company, battalion, brigade, division, corps, right? So squad, squads, uh, you know, a few, a handful of people, a section is usually two squads. A platoon is normally between, say, uh, 16 or so in a tank company to 35 or 40. Uh, and then a company is 100 to a couple 300. It just depends on the type uh, of unit. A battalion is several hundred, normally, you know, three to three to five, three to six hundred uh, brigades, a few thousand uh, division is, you know, again, it, it depends on the type of division and it depends on what's what's attached to it. But it's going to be 15, 20,000 ish. And then a core is normally about triple that. Right. So that that's essentially how they break down. There's a whole lot of variation even within each of those categories. Uh, but that's in general terms uh, how it's it's structured. All right, I appreciate that color, um, Rick. Back to you. And I remember in our conversation you had mentioned you focus on and think about modernization. So a reader or listener rather suggested question: How did Ukraine's military change between 2014 and 2022? Yeah, there's this perception that the Ukrainian military has made more improvements since 2014 than it had in the previous 20 years of engagement with, with the United States and with NATO allies and partners, with, with Western militaries uh, overall. Um, the, the relationship with NATO was formalized in the late 1990s, and it kind of gone through a, a period of ebbs and flows. Um, but really, after 2014 and after uh, Russia's annexation of, of Crimea and, and the fomentation of the war, really kind of the first stage of, of what we're seeing now, the precursor, NATO intensified and the United States intensified its engagement with Ukraine and Ukraine reciprocated. NATO put together this, a thing called this comprehensive assistance package, which was this group of uh, defense and security related reform measures. Uh, NATO also uh, deemed Ukraine what's called an enhanced opportunities partner in 2020, which gave the Ukrainian military more opportunities for training and exercise. And the Ukrainian military you know, did its part in being cited about these reforms, uh, taking part in these reforms, and and wanting to modernize its military, uh, and, and for the very good reason of defending its its territory. Um, so, the Ukrainian military has has done quite a bit of modernization since 2014, been integrated into Western procurement networks, been integrated and in achieving more interoperability with with uh, with NATO forces. It had, it had made a, it has made a lot more progress since 2014 than it has in in probably the, the decade or so beforehand. So, one terminology you said interoperability. What does that mean? And then, as far as the specific reforms, is that 
introducing, I've, I've read this, introducing NCOs? Like, what does that look like on the ground for what's changing? Yeah, so interoperability is the the capacity of, of two uh, different types of forces, and they don't have to necessarily be multinational forces. They could be, let's say, an aviation unit and an infantry unit. The ability of, the, of two different units to uh, communicate effectively, to work together effectively, and in a safe manner to achieve a, a common mission. And so one of the hallmarks of, of NATO is, is this idea of interoperability between, between all al- allies, not, not only all allies, but allies and partners. Uh, and the idea is to have this interoperability at different echelons. And so what Bob was talking about previously, so different units, different levels of units from sections, you know, squads, uh, platoons, companies, and all the way up. Uh, so that's what we mean by by uh, interoperability. Bob, well, any thoughts on other reform measures or thoughts on how Ukraine's military changed? In talking to people who, who worked this uh, issue in Ukraine, people in the Office of Defense Cooperation in Kiev, and then people at the, uh, the U.S. Uh, training mission uh, that was in Western Ukraine up until uh, the start of the full-scale invasion in February 2022, the general sense among these folks is that at lower levels, at the tactical level, uh, there was pretty significant change. There was the the introduction and the acceptance, the embracing of what we call mission command, which is essentially, uh, Rick mentioned earlier, commanders articulating an intent for an operation uh, and, then, and then empowering their subordinates to achieve that intent without having to ask for permission to take every step. Um, so at lower levels, there was a sense that mission command had been implemented, had been embraced. There was a lot of skepticism, to be honest, uh, among the Western trainers and the Western advisors at the higher levels, at sort of, you know, the army level, uh, the general staff, ministry of defense level. Uh, and I've heard a couple of people who were in the in the U.S. embassy say that there were some very key changes that uh, Zelensky made in the in the six to 12 months prior to the war. Uh, new defense minister, new chief of the general staff that had those changes not been made, uh, Ukraine may not have fared as well as it did in the early stages of the war. So uh, I think there was a lot of change, a lot of reform and transformation at lower levels. It, As always in militaries, it takes it's harder and it takes longer for that transformation reform to percolate its way up the system uh, and affect really the top levels. I guess a follow-up question. What about since 2022? You know, no no plan survives contact with the enemy. So have we seen Ukraine's military or approach changed after the war started? Are we seeing any broad patterns there? That's a great question. I would actually have to think about that a little. I, what I think we saw early on in the war uh, was the inability of the higher levels uh, to affect what was happening at lower levels just because things were happening so fast. The Russians had invaded on four different axes, you know, four different thrusts in different parts of the country. And small Ukrainian units were having to sort of develop the situation on their own, fight the invasion with what they had and couldn't afford to wait for direction uh, from Kiev. And I guess what we've seen over the course of the war is a little more of the institutionalization of decision making and things like that. So we're through the crisis phase. Uh, we're through the acute phase, and now we're sort of in a chronic phase uh, where uh, I, I think you've seen the, the defense enterprise, the defense institutions in Ukraine take a greater role in the war than they were able to early on. So, Rick, over to you. I hear talk of mobilization. There's been a couple of rounds of mobilization on both sides. And the way people talk about it, now, I don't know if either of you are Monty Python fans like, like I am, but there's a scene at the end of the Holy Grail where King Arthur just out of nowhere says, army, assemble, and waves his sword, and then the army shows up out of nowhere. They had this army the whole time. Why didn't they use it? Many, many questions there. And I feel like people talk about mobilization in a similar way. They're just, the army appears. So when Russia or Ukraine or the United States says, hey, we're mobilizing, what what does that actually mean? And then if you're really doing total mobilization to get your average Joe or Ivan or Serhi up to speed, like how long does it take to make a person a competent enough soldier? Yeah, so mobilization is, as you said, marshalling and organizing and, and assembling all of the the military resources in a country uh, to support a nation's defense or, or strategic objectives. Um, and let's look at uh, 
at personnel in that re- in that regard and how long it takes to take uh, your average you know Sergey off the street and make him a soldier so and let's let's uh let's kind of take a look at how the US Army does it and this is this is one metric to, to kind of to kind of assess the timeline so uh, US Army basic training is is 10 weeks uh, and then what this does is essentially take a you know a kid from high school, and, and turn them into a soldier. And this is, entails kind of four phases along this 10, 10 weeks. And the first phase is kind of the army values, uh, learning discipline, physical training, first aid, stuff like that. And the second phase is is getting used to, to holding and being around weapons and weaponry, uh, individual weapons, your rifle, uh, and then also combat skills, obstacle courses, obstacle courses as a team so you can learn how to cooperate work as a team to, to figure out a goal. Uh, the third phase is rifle basic. So basic kind of marksmanship, shooting a rifle at targets, um, developing kind of tactical combat uh, scenarios and movements and doing also kind of field training. So how to, how to move your body and move as a, as a, uh, as a team in a tactical environment. And the fourth phase is kind of, it's like kind of advanced marksmanship This is uh, heavier machine guns, grenades, stuff like that, and land navigation and some other kind of uh, uh, movements as as units. So that's about 10 weeks. And then after that, there's another nine weeks of what's called advanced individual training. That's when you learn about your particular specialty, whether you're uh, an infantryman, an intelligence soldier, a a communicator, uh, cyber, cyber specialty, stuff like that. So... That's about 20 weeks of taking someone off the street and making them a soldier that that is then going to go off to his or her first unit. And a soldier that can contribute, but a soldier that is still pretty inexperienced. So it takes quite a bit of time. And that's, uh, you know, that's about a half a year of time to get someone ready to go off the street to to off to their first unit. Now, I've heard in Ukraine, and understandable why, there there are units, and I've heard about uh, territorial units. So if you could tell me what that means that are getting a lot less training. So, so th- it's it's possible to fight with with less training. Yes, sure, it's possible to, to fight with less training. At, at t- and territorial un- units in the Ukraine context, I I suspect what it is because this is what it is in, in many European contexts. It is it is it is units that are comprised of soldiers from a specific territory, a specific kind of a home turf. So, uh, in some ways. These units could have a leg up on an enemy because they know the terrain, they know the area, they have the benefits of, of having uh, already kind of local networks of, of people and resources that they can tap into in, in times of crisis. We are arriving at our final question, which I will turn over to Bob, not least because of your choice of acronym. I believe SOSRA was the was the uh, your word. And, it was. Uh, it uh, is relevant because one of the things we're seeing, at least in the news, is that reports that Ukraine's southern counteroffensive is taking time, some say more time than it should or uh, than was expected, and it's due to Russians being dug in. I guess what I'm wondering is, is how hard is it to break through a defensive line? What do you got to do in, in practice to make that happen? Right. It's one of the hardest things any military can do. We call it an obstacle breach. uh, And it really is one of the hardest combat tasks for any ground force. Uh, You know, the Russians in Ukraine have had extensive time to prepare their defensive lines. They knew the Ukrainian counteroffensive was coming. So uh, their lines are covered by minefields that are anywhere from three to 10 miles deep with any personnel and any tanker, uh, any vehicle mines. Those are covered by both direct fire by dug-in defenders behind the minefields and indirect fire from from rockets, artillery, and aircraft. Uh, The defenders will have multiple positions that they can displace to to protect them, and there'll be dug-in positions with overhead cover to protect them from artillery fire. So uh, now I'll I'll redeploy my my SOSRA acronym, which this is the the doctrinal way that, uh, at least in the U.S. Army, uh, we teach breaching an obstacle. And it's as I said earlier, suppress, obscure, secure, reduce, and assault. So suppress just means prevent or degrade the enemy uh, from from shooting at you, right? You want to suppress the enemy, make them keep their heads down. Uh, So using uh, usually indirect fire, you're dropping artillery, mortars, uh, or rockets or missiles on them to make them keep their heads down. 
Then you obscure. Basically, we use often we use smoke to do that so that the enemy can't see you as you're breaching the obstacle. Uh, then we secure means you have to de decide where you're going to breach the obstacle, right? You're going to breach it with usually multiple uh, but fairly narrow lanes so you don't have to remove or destroy more mines uh, and go through more wire and, and, and ditches and things than you need to. Um, so you secure um, the reduction areas and then you do the actual reduction. That's reduced. So you create lanes for your forces to pass through. You remove uh, wire, you remove mines, uh, you, you uh, breach uh, or you put uh, ways to cross trenches and ditches and things like that. Uh, so you get your lanes and then you assault. And that the assault means uh, passing your forces through the lanes and assaulting the enemy in his positions or making him move. Um, and and that's, that's the way you breach an obstacle, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort and usually involves a lot of casualties. So this is what we're seeing Ukrainians have to do right now in, uh, in their counteroffensive. Any comments, Rick? I would just say it's, it's so difficult to break through a defensive line because your defensive force is always going to be more protected uh, and less exposed. Well, that takes us to the end of our questions. I certainly learned a lot doing this, and I hope the listeners did too. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Appreciate it. Thanks to Bob and Rick for joining. I certainly learned a lot and hope you, listener, did too. The Continent Podcast is brought to you by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, that's FPRI, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. For more information about this initiative and many others, be sure to visit fpri.org. We'll be back in September, so in the interim, have a great rest of your summer. We'll catch you soon.